All right, fair warning, guys. I have actually seen this, the first two episodes, because they're both out right now in Funimation, which, by the way, you guys should definitely go to Funimation right now. Go watch them. It is really good. But I'm not as, like, invested in this one as I ever was with, like, Scumbag Villain and Grandmaster, her other works. And for some odd reason... The characters in this one in particular's names elude me on how to pronounce. So a lot of these people will probably just have nicknames again. Because I don't want to butcher them. I'd feel bad, okay? Um, be in that mind, uh, I hope we all have a good time, okay? So the first two episodes and part of the third upcoming episode focus on the bridegroom arc which I remember most vividly and has one of my favorite character introductions in as well, even though I can never, again, remember the, the character's name. And it's always been kind of like a spooky story to me. Honestly, I wish I was able to have seen this episode on Halloween because... Uh, yeah, so the bridegrooms are, are uh, attacked one by one throughout the years and they go missing, basically. So after the beautiful opening and the bride getting kidnapped by zombies, whatever, we get to see what is probably my most favorite scene of episode one, at least, which is, you know, our dear heavenly protagonist. I can't pronounce his last name, but I believe from based on how to pronounce that it's Lian, Lin, Lian, uh, we're going to call him Prince. Anyways, he ascends for the third time. And everybody's just like, who could it be? And then they see it's him. And they're just like, ah, screws. Just screw this. It's hilarious. Our protagonist then finds out that in this ascension, he has caused so much damage. He's destroyed a bell and he's completely moved a castle that was once in one area to a completely another area. He owes a lot, a lot of money. He is in debt. Debt that he can't afford. He is a poor scrap metal god, man. <laughs> oh, I really, I really felt for him in this. Uh, the anime is doing a very good job of like expressing just the utter comical nature, honestly, of him that I didn't even think about before. Blue-haired goddess is like, hey, I got a way that you can start to pay back. And she pretty much assigns him the bridegroom case, but is like, hey, let me see if I can get anybody to help you. And nobody does. Nobody wants to. And I remembered from the book that a lot of people in the heaven most did not like him. Did not like him. He is not popular. But he's even more so not popular because he destroyed the bell and he moved that one guy's castle. So nobody is going to help him. He's like, I expected as much. He was, he was not surprised. He does eventually get Junior sent to help him. And I think I know what's going on with them, if I remember correctly, but I'm not sure. So I'm not going to say anything about them other than supposedly they are the Junior's to the to two gods who used to serve Len as a uh, human. And one of them is actually the one whose castle he tapped over. I knew that 100% sure. There's also a huge joke about how uh, one of them, their name is, got uh, miswritten or something. And he basically is a them for like a big dick. Which is funny. Honestly, the two are pretty hilarious. And they're clearly not too happy to be there. It's Supposedly, they, they, just, they, they went on their own and they didn't tell the gods that they work for. Again, the people that used to work for, you know, Shin Lian? Lian? I want to say Lian. I don't know. I, I went on howtopronounce.com and I got like Lian, Lian. So you, you guys tell me how you think I should pronounce the poor main character's name. Also, best spit take ever. Their fights are so hilarious, though. And look at the main character's face. Every face he makes is either very beautiful or very comical. There's, like, no in between. 
at some point, our poor prince, our poor protagonist, tries to help this one girl against some ruffians, and he chases them away, right? But then he tries to help her, but in the process, it made it look like he was undressing. So she he got slapped, dude, and she runs away in a huff, you know? And it's hilarious, because it seems like every time he tries to help people, it just does not go in his favor. Like a thankless job. And he also ends up having to pay for some destroyed building stuff, which, you know, that's great. Anyways, they find out that the person, spirit thing behind the whole bridegroom thing is probably a rat. So they try to come up with a plan, and <laughs> it's so funny because the main character's like, uh, I can't put another girl in danger. We can't do that. And they're like, but what male would agree? And the two juniors look at each other, then they look at him, and he's like, ah, crap. Ah, uh, I just love the dynamics between these three. This Dangwa is making me appreciate the story a lot more. I might actually go and reread the novel after all this. We then get a hilarious scene of him trying to look like a girl. And honestly, as a girl, I can say he didn't do a bad job. It's just maybe he went a little too thick on some of the stuff, you know? But really, it, it isn't that bad. <laughs> The plain Jane from earlier does come by and as thanks for helping her, because realize, you know, oh crap, I messed up. He was just being helpful. She does fix his makeup and his dress and all that. On the caravan on their way to the on the path where the ghost brides are usually taken, they unknowingly are followed by those ruffians from earlier. Meanwhile, in the caravan, after some time our protagonist starts hearing very beautiful music, but Eerie basically warning him to not smile. And he's like, do you guys hear that? And nobody does, which again is creepy. And he reveals, uh, I've been smiling since I sat down in here. Soon after, wolves and these creepy monsters start attacking. And... They're, like, trying to fight them off, but there just seems to just be never-ending. There's easily a hundred of these zombie-looking things. So our protagonist is like, you guys run, I'll stay here, and I will see what happens. Eventually, things stop trying to come and attack him. And then a butterfly appears, and I know what's happening. And those of you who know, know what's happening when that butterfly appears. And that's when a hand reaches in. And he's a little nervous, and he goes to take it, and he, we see just this, this, this part of this handsome, beautiful face. Like, I know who it is, you know who it is, but some of you don't know, and that's okay. <laughs> a voice starts narrating, and we get a flashback to when the prince was still a prince and not a god. And we see this beautiful imagery of, you know, like a parade and him wearing this mask and stuff. And then it goes back to the present. We see him officially taking the offered hand and clumsily falling into the other person. And that person just tenderly catching him. Oh, my God. Like, to describe it, it almost doesn't do the certain service. You gotta watch it. Like, oh, my God. We then go back to the flashback of the parade and we see this poor boy who I know who that is. We see him falling and then we see the prince masked, who's masked at that time still go and catch him with such grace. And the, the person narrating is speaking almost lovingly as if speaking to a something he worships and loves. And it's like, oh my God. I just really love this whole scene because the past and the present keep like mirroring and merging with each other to where it's almost seamless and it's just so beautiful like the present person prince will fall but then the past little boy will fall and you know it just keeps going back and forth and just like a dance we also get to see stuff like the prince defeating a, a monster in his past life and how he gained favor with the gods and he ended up, you know, becoming a god at only 17. Like, the boy was so freaking young. 
He didn't even get to become an adult before they're like, you're a god now. Time flies in the past, and we could see the boy who had fallen at one point. He's now older. He's like a teenager or whatever. And we see him staring longingly, almost reaching out for the prince who's a god now. And he's the god. He's in despair because his freaking country's in, in flames and people are dying, and he can't seem to do anything about it. And the boy is just like, I don't know. It's, it's, oh, it's, I'm almost in tears. I can't describe it. You guys just gotta watch it. We then see the god telling the boy, you know, if you have nothing else to live for, live for me. And if, and he just takes that. He's like, I will. I will. You're my god now. You're, you're my god. <laughs> I mean, that little boy had so much hardships, and every time it seemed like when he was at his lowest, his god was there to help him, so why not? And I know more comes into play with this later, so, and I'm not going to say much else, because again, I don't want to spoil. Anyways, the episode ends with them back in the present with the mystery man, butterfly man leading the prince through a basically rain of blood. And he has no idea because he's been protecting him this whole time with his umbrella. And uh, I don't know. There's just something romantic about it, even without knowing the context of what's going on, you know? Anyways, long story short, just watch the first episode. Go watch the second episode. You can watch it on Funimation and you can watch it on Billy Billy. So please do. It's great. It's awesome. I will do episode two later. I just didn't want to do both of them in the same video because otherwise it would be so freaking long. And I will try to figure out how to pronounce these names. Oh my God, guys. I am so sorry. <laughs>